Back in 2004, I was lucky enough to take part in the London to Sydney Marathon, which is the event I consider to be the granddaddy of all long distance rallies. And on this special programme, we're going to be taking a look back at that event and a look forward to the 2014 Sydney to London Marathon, which is basically the same event, but run in the opposite direction. The main reason behind this change of direction is the extraordinary restrictive quarantine rules now in place in Australia, which means that it is virtually impossible to take a dirty rally car into Australia when it is taking part on an event. And the cleaning process that faced us all on the 2004 rally was something that none of us will ever forget. And to give you an example of the quarantine rules to enter Australia, every dead insect of the radiator must be removed, every part of the car must be cleaned because the inspector will come along and he's put his fingers inside the chassis and if he brings a grain of sand, wash it again. And, it, and it, when we did it in 2004, we spent three days cleaning the cars in India and they still all failed the quarantine. So we'll talk more to event director Mark Soloway later. But now let's take a look at the 2004 rally on which I competed in a Group N specification MGZR. With a rally allowing both modern Group N cars and also historic specification cars in a direct battle against each other. But also with their own categories to win. And one of the first away was a monster Holden. The noise from its exhaust making small children cry and scaring the birds from the trees. The Callanans then went out to make some noise. And despite the size and power of the car, Keith really pushed it through the tight British forest stages. With Joe McAndrew, the first and the fastest of the modern cars, it was fascinating to compare the performance of the modern and historic machinery with a perfect mix of cars filling the top 10 places. After an overnight ferry from Portsmouth, we were now in France and set for a long day with a couple of tarmac stages thrown in. Indeed, it was going to be interesting to see how the historic cars would perform on tarmac. Old they may be, but bolstered by the latest in modern technology, they were all very powerful and very light, and they took four of the top five positions on this stage. Although that might have had a little bit to do with this. John McCandrew always wants to be quickest, and here was no exception. Needless to say, he wanted to get out in a bit of a hurry. So even our cameraman helped. But the watching spectators refused to. This was all a big surprise to the following competitors and no doubt a development that caused huge amusement amongst the Toyota crews. got their measure, Graham Lorimer had said just a few minutes before, but even he probably didn't expect things to swing their way quite so quickly. After three days, maybe surprisingly leading the rally overall now, was the huge monster 5 litre 500 horsepower Holden Monaro of Keith and Mary Ann Callinan. He might not get round the corners too well, but it simply flew down the straights. Although that much smoke coming from your exhaust is never a good sign, it has to be said. And it wasn't too long before they started to drop down the field again. This was all good news for Joe McCandrew, who only seems to know one way to drive, and that's flat out. And he set a time 20 seconds quicker than anyone else on the day's first stage, and was already back into the top 10 after his previous days off. But now in the lead with Jimmy McCray and Bruce Lyle, driving cleanly and professionally, and doing just what was needed although bothered by the Monaro smoke stream, which in the still calm air was lingering for ages. What a smoke from this car in front, the Monaro hanging in the trees. Well, there was a lot of it. One of the most difficult things to get used to is the marathon mindset. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. We've finished the day's two stages already, and we've now got a nine and a half hour road section to the evening halt. So by rights, we should be there at 6.30. Let's hope it's a nice trip. And it was a pleasant trip. This was only day four of the London to Sydney Marathon, but it was already becoming apparent 
that the round sections would be just as important as the stages, only in a different way. The stage is generally only made up about half an hour of each day, whereas the road sections were as much as 12 hours long and were very tiring for both car and crew. And yes, that is the road that we just drove along. But at least the organisers had made the effort to always take us along the most interesting routes. This was certainly an event that would live up to its marathon name. Towards the end of the trip, we came up behind the Holden Monaro, which was still running and not smoking anymore. And when we arrived at the evening halt, we were able to ask him why it had been smoking so badly. Because the piston let go and then it became very smoky and the people behind us couldn't see. And I panicked and then I slowed down and then I tried to get Marianne to make a phone call while we were driving through the stage, which does tend to slow you down somewhat. We were now in Italy, with two runs of the same two stages ahead of us. And on the first stage, it was Anthony Ward's turn to be quickest in the Mark 1 Escort. And if you wonder how these 40-year-old cars can be so quick, let me reassure you, they are not 40 years old. They are newly built by Historic Rally Sport, and have nearly 240 horsepower in a car that weighs about two-thirds the weight of the modern car. There were, though, the warnings of problems for Simon Glover, with his clutch showing signs of failing. This Ford Mustang is a big, growly car, and it's driven by a big, growly driver. Going extremely well. You were flying around there today. Thank you. I enjoyed the stages. They're a bit tight for this car, but it uh, didn't matter. We're just uh, it's a lot of uphill stuff, so the car enjoyed it. I enjoyed the drive, so. Had a, great, had a great time. But for Nelson and Nick Marshall, this was the start of what was to be their last stage of the rally. Running just behind them on the road, and having a whale of a time of it, it has to be said, we were once again aware of a warning triangle. An OK board, a crew okay member, board. and then firmly up against a tree, a seriously wrecked the tree. This car was knackered, and the roll cage had collapsed. Yeah, we were held up for quite a while with that Porsche for about three or four kilometres. He wouldn't move over. Oh, yeah. Of course, I got a bit <laughs> off, and uh, when I finally passed him, I gave it a big bootful in the corner Titan, and it's all my own fault. It was already becoming obvious that trying to do this event without your own service backup <laughs> was actually the hardest thing about the rally. Yeah. Just look at the setups of some of the other crews here, and you can see what Terry and I were up against. Even changing your car onto tarmac tyres for the next road section and the day stages becomes a bit of a drag when you're sometimes having to do it twice a day. And then it was onto the stages. Superb, wide open, fast, and it has to be said, a bit rocky. But isn't this what rallying is all about? Driving as fast as you can on roads like this. We were really enjoying ourselves until... Five hundred over crest. Got a puncture. How far to go? Left um, Back K. With only a few minutes between this stage and the next one, this was not the time to have to change a wheel. 
and in full racing gear, and with the sun scorching down on my black overalls, I couldn't have been much hotter if I'd put myself in an oven. The thing is, when we get to the other time control anyway, we'll get there on time, and then we've still got 20 minutes. Yeah. There's still been a delay again because of the two minute watches. We don't have to worry about tyre pressures yet. It's a bit disappointing though. After this, I was just about shattered and decided to ask Mark Soloway if his mechanics could help us out from time to time when necessary. And such is the level of camaraderie on a rally like this, they were happy to. Both of the historic Rally Sport Run escorts were running in the top 10 of the rally. With Simon Glover and Russ Langthorne, six overall and leading the historic category, and Anthony Ward and team boss Mark Soloway, ninth overall and third in the historics. The beauty of these cars is that they look like the original specification Mark 1 Escorts, even if the regulations allow quite a lot of suspension modifications nowadays. The engines are also much more highly tuned, although here they only gave out about 240 horsepower after Mark detuned them for this rally. But don't they look like the cars that did the original marathon events in the late 60s and early 70s? With their cars checked, the mechanics amused themselves by checking our car over. And I think they were a little surprised by just how standard it was. With our car having had a quick check over, it was amazing how much more confident I felt. And our time through here was pretty good as well. Nowhere near the front runners of course, but it was very good for us. And then off we went to the airport to be greeted by this extraordinary sight. This was one of the two Antonovs especially converted to airlift all the vehicles to India. The trouble was, it takes a long time to pack these cars on here as they literally have to be loaded and strapped in one at a time. Then it was my turn and it all seemed pretty straightforward from the inside. But from the outside, you can see just how close I was to losing the boot. The man behind the 2014 Sydney to London Marathon is Mark Soloway, the boss of historic rally sport, and a competitor himself on the 2000 and 2004 events. And we asked him why he'd come up with the plan to run a rally like this when many suspected it could never happen again. The idea to run the event just came from experience of doing two previous uh, London to Sydney's uh, and since Nick Britton passed away then the guy that was behind them is gone and I had so much uh, success and fun on the London to Sydney's uh, I just thought of let's try and run one again but this time run it in the opposite direction start in Sydney finish in London because the extreme uh, strict quarantine rules in Australia this is a way of getting around them because you can take a dirty car out but you can't take a dirty rally car in. The vastness of Australia makes it a fabulous country for a long distance event and Mark outlined the route for us. The route across Australia is 12 days uh, it starts in Sydney and we head then west towards Adelaide and eventually and across the Nullumbar uh, over to Perth. The difference is at this time is, whereas in previous London Sydneys they've used a lot of farm tracks, but this, this event is concentrating on real smooth gravel uh, stages which they use in the ARC and even over to Perth where you know we've been running the Bunnings Yump stages, the WRC stages. We want to make the event smooth and attractable so people don't have to build special cars to do it. You could use like a British Championship car, you know, no problem to do the event. Then when we get to Perth we have a day off before the airlift uh, where all the cars will be air freighted from Perth to Ankara and Turkey. In the past, they've used the Russian Antonov planes with a racking system, um, but the cost of them now has just gone out of, out of question. We've now chartered a 747 freighter plane, which we can get uh, only five cars less than an Antonov, you know, and so we can get 44 cars in one of them, and that aircraft will take off from Perth and then get them to, to Europe in Turkey, ready for the European leg. And the European leg starts in Ankara, and then heads north then, using all some real good smooth uh, tarmac roads uh, all the way up to Istanbul. And then we go north of Istanbul then, and we cross the border into Bulgaria. 
again, I've been lucky enough to drive all these stages recently, and they are real top quality stages, really smooth, technical, uh, and very demanding on the drivers. Then we get through Bulgaria into Serbia, uh, then cross from Serbia into Croatia, where there's some even better stages, you know, which is hard to believe because they're all so good, you know. There's even one stage in Croatia, they call it the, the stage of a thousand corners. It's 22 kilometers long and a thousand corners on it. And then we cross into Italy um, and then do some real good stages up in the mountains where one of them uh, is used as a ski slope uh, in the winter for the skiing, you know. Then we cross into France and get to do some of the classic Monte Carlo stages. Uh, and then head north then, again, up to, to cross into the UK for the final sting in the tail. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? And more on the background to the event later. But for now, let's rejoin my travails on the 2004 rally. And now we have arrived in India. The Indian leg was to be a straightforward anti-clockwise loop of southern India, starting in Cochin, before travelling east to Monar, north to Coimbatore, further north to Mysore and then beginning our trip back down to Cochin. So here we are in front of absolutely thousands of people in Cochin about to start the Indian leg of the event uh, and we're starting it with no trip meter because that's just failed as we're on the way here. It's not a good way to start this part of the event. We told the uh, guys in front and the people behind that we haven't got one and we might have to follow them because the Indian idea of a map seems to be to draw a straight line between any two places so this is going to be fun. And so away we went into simply the biggest crowd of people that I have ever seen at the start of a rally, and all watching us with bemused awe. For amateurs like us, it was slightly surreal, and it continued down the road for miles and miles, with children being let out of schools just to scare us with their screaming. It wasn't long before the whole thing was starting to get less than enjoyable. So this is um, driving in traffic Indian style. It's, it's about as exciting as uh, actually taking part in the rally itself. Buses overtake the wrong side of dual carriageway just because I think it's a bit quicker. And then they just bully people out of the way. Just look at this. Everybody told us what to expect in India, but we didn't actually expect anything like that. Every single second you had to be on your guard because as we soon discovered, the Indian idea of driving on the road is simply to drive straight at you with the horn blaring and hope that you get out of the way. Eventually, he caught one of our group out. Been on the road for two and a half hours, been long, tough, wearing, trying to keep out of the way, the buses and the trucks. And you can see the result, what happens if you just don't take that little bit of care. Fortunately, both the crew members are okay, but this is... Uh, Car that's definitely out the rally. Uh, the bloody car hit me off the road and I put my foot on the whip on the, on the rocks and I gave way. But we're alright, keep going. Just tell everybody we're okay. So it's been a really tough day, never is f***ed off. Apart from you. Apart from me. Is there any place you'd rather be than here? No. Nope. Why is that? Are you on the London and Sydney rally? And so we're halfway through. And so we should appreciate what we're doing, shouldn't we? No, then. At least the historic rally sport lads were there to help check the car over for us again and fit the gravel tyres for the following day's tarmac stages. But then, even one of the fitted gravel tyres turned out to be soft after they'd gone, and the rain was at its worst. I thought doing these international rallies was supposed to be glamorous. Still, you couldn't argue with the dramaticness of the scenery or the friendliness of the people. Oh. 
Having lost 25 seconds to Joe McAndrew on the previous day's stage, it was perhaps a surprise to see Jimmy McRae take a total of 70 seconds off McAndrew on the day's two stages. Although McRae was as happy as anybody when they were over. Aye, OK, it's very, very, very bumpy and twisty and not a very nice stage. <laughs> you could make a mistake in there very easy. The big rocks at the side of the road. Was... But anyway, we're here, that's the main thing. McAndrew actually thought that he'd been much quicker than Jimmy, so there must have been some mix-up over times. And when he got to the end, he thought he was in the lead. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, we had quite good traction in there and the car felt really good through there, so we just kept pushing. And, um, yeah, we just got through it well. There's uh, a lot of obstacles to miss and we got through it safely, so I'm pretty happy at the moment. So far, so good for the Toyota team then. But for Steve Blunt and Bob Duck, it was about to go horribly wrong and at the worst possible time. The OK board and warning triangle let us know that someone was off, but OK. And it was disappointing to see it was one of our fellow British crews who'd taken a tumble. But they weren't the only ones. Paul Darasett was about to throw his car so far off the road that we couldn't even see it as we went by. His car was a long way down. But this was yet another real tribute to the people who make safety cages, as both crew members were almost unbelievably perfectly uninjured. Paul explained what had happened. Came into this corner here, just too hot. On the brakes, hit some gravel here, and instead of getting off the brake quickly back on it and powering through, panicked, kept on the brake, slid through here. We toppled on the edge for what seemed like 10 years, and then boom, boom, boom. And there we are, 100 feet down in the bush. We're all OK. Everybody's well. Fit and well, but financially a little insecure. <laughs> With the help of all the guys, we'll get the car out and we'll get back in this race. He wants to get back in it. If my car was down there, I think that I'd leave it there and then get a taxi home. But would that be an Indian taxi? Yes, it would. Hey, guys, get my car out, please. At the end of the stage, co-driver Paul Williamson stops for a consoling chat with Steve Blunt. But sadly for both crews, having seen Hondas throwing themselves off the road and losing very little time, this was a stage with a big maximum, and so they dropped at least 20 minutes here. Quite remarkably, the Darasset Williams Ford Capri was back on the road again the following day, still looking slightly the worse for wear, it has to be said. But at least they've got two trip meters, which was twice as many as we'd got. We were to run two stages here that were known as the windmill stages because, believe it or not, we were on a wind farm. And the New Zealand Honda team were determined that they needed to start doing something about those pesky Toyotas. So they were doing the rally version of the Hacker. You know, that wild dance that the Maoris do. But they'd forgotten all the moves. Whatever it was, it must have worked because despite all Jimmy McRae's efforts, the Hondas were simply stunning around here with only McRae stopping them from getting the top three times on each stage. We did quite well too really, as the tight, twisty nature of the stages meant that we could make the most of the MG's handling, and we were 13th quickest on the first run, which was our best result so far. The twisty nature of the stages made it all pretty confusing though, and at one point I thought we were lost. How can we go around it again? But we were merely going in the same direction as we had been before, on a parallel road. But then on the second run, the handling of our car went away, and I feared that we'd broken a shack absorber or something similar. And we again lost time to the Porsche crew. After the fun of the stages, and they had been great fun, 
we were back into the reality of driving on normal Indian roads and all that that entailed. So here we are back in the madness. At least the sun's shining now and it's a bit more like the India we, we came to uh, expect. The sun's out, it's very hot and it's completely crackers. Where else would you see a bull walking calmly down the road, for example, without a care in the world? Where on earth is he going? Perhaps he's on a promise. Or cattle with gaily decorated horns. You really can't describe how mad this all is. It's, uh, it, it's really, really tiring. And uh, only one word of advice. If anybody offered, ever offers you the chance to do a rally in India, don't think twice about it. Don't do it. So we're just about to start the final day's rallying in India, although after we finish the rallying we've got two days of cleaning the cars to get ready for Australia. In the background you can see the extraordinary Latifa Palace where we stayed last night and look at the thousands of people who've turned up to see us uh, take part in the day's adventures. There's almost as many people as you can expect at a World Rally Championship event I should imagine and they're all very enthusiastic, treating us like some sort of gods, which is a bit unnerving at times knowing that we're basically all amateur drivers. It's um, quite a nice feeling though I have to say. This was in fact the same stage run twice, and with it being mainly run uphill, it was of course yet again just perfect for the power of the Toyotas and the Hondas. And once again, it was Macandra who was quickest. He'd actually been quickest on five of the seven stages that had been run in India. Yes, that's right, we may have been in India for a week, but we only managed seven stages. And when you like driving, that didn't seem an awful lot because that's what we were there for, after Stay all. Stay right into open hairpin left. Right, right! I've got to get over there. F***ing hell, that's scary, that is. Because it's that's so hard. 300, medium right. This was the last stage in India, and we were still trying as hard as ever, even though we knew it was pointless, really. We now had to wash our cars before the trip to Australia. So it's uh, 7.30 in the morning, we've been here for an hour, and having spent nearly all of yesterday cleaning the car inside and out, we now have to strip everything out of the car, which I've already done, and three chaps are just redoing the work that we did yesterday. There's people been around here for all of yesterday. What doesn't make any sense is why we did any work at all yesterday, because they're all redoing it. These are all the parts that we had to take out of the car and carry to the other end of the compound. After several hours, it was our turn for the car to go up on the ramps. And a pretty scary process that was as well. The following morning, we were all at the airport bright and early. But it was still a bit chaotic. The methodology that the Indians use to speed up the process is so fantastic mm. that they actually made a line to nowhere. Obviously, travelling around the world with a couple of hundred people in their vehicles is never going to be the easiest of tasks. And the man responsible for the logistics and coordination of this great event is a former ProDrive employee, Ken Reese. Uh, the, the difficulties are with the, the amount of people we're taking. Obviously, there's two crew per car, there's organisation, there's uh, quite a few other people involved with it all. Um, we will all, the European people will fly hopefully together to... Uh, Australia um, and then the Australians will join us there and when we come back to Europe the Australians will need to fly back so there's those situations also there's the uh, matter of hotels hotels never get enough hotels or big enough hotels so that all has to be looked into uh, at this point the Australians have done the reconnaissance from Sydney across to Perth and along the route they've been to hotels fee booked hotels looked at the amount of accommodation and uh, I think at some point we might be sleeping on the canvas, you know, which makes it even more of, a, of an adventure. Once we get to Europe, um, Mark has already done the route with, uh, with Mike across. They've looked at hotels and we've also got an agency working on major hotels in areas at the start and midways and the finishes. So the, um, all the accommodation is suitable for everybody. But when you're dealing with customers, they have their own demands in many ways and their own necessities. So there's 
that little thing as, as my experience is running a world championship team and everybody is told where they're going these people sometimes tell us where they want to go so we have to look into that side of it all but um it, it'll all it'll all work out it's going to be a big adventure good fun and our own 2004 adventure continued as the rally reached australia We at last had reached Australia, our final destination on this extraordinary adventure. And we all immediately felt at home. Even the fish in the harbour at Darwin were reassuringly welcoming. And these were a far cry from the man-eating sharks and deadly jellyfish that we'd been warned about. We were now setting off right into the middle of the Australian outback, where even the main roads were made of gravel. Today's section would take us from Kubapedi to Munganari, over 620 kilometres with two long stages promised. Now it was really starting to turn into a marathon, and we were a long way from home. In the background, you can hear a passing local giving us a typical Aussie greeting. Where are all you mad buggers heading for? It's a long way to anywhere from here, apart from the rubbish tip perhaps. We still hadn't reached the lunch halt, and spending so much time on these long desert roads was causing us to hallucinate. Why else would we think that this huge water tank looked a bit like a dog? And of course, this wasn't really a flower, was it? And it just got weirder and weirder. Apart from the wind, this place was just peaceful, calm, and a little bit surreal, it has to be said. And then, back to reality, with the afternoon stages. Five, four, three, two, one. It was now clear that McAndrew seemed to have been binding his time so far in this rally, as he proceeded to pulverise everyone else again on the day's two stages, being over 30 seconds quicker than the next fastest crew. And his version of the middle of the road is quite different to mine, but if this is keeping it in the middle, I'd hate to see it when he's trying. Certainly everyone else was trying their hardest, but McAndrew wasn't just in a different class, he was at a different school. No, this isn't a special stage that we're on. This is the main road from Birdsville to Indora. 400 kilometres of dusty, rocky road. We're overtaking any car in an adventure in itself. But we've got 400 kilometres to do. It'll take us only about three and a half hours because you can actually average 80 to 90 miles an hour on these roads. But it's really, really hard work. It's, you know, this is a, a different type of driving, a different type of endurance, both for the car and the driver. And one of the nice things about this event is that competitors aren't tied to doing the whole route, as Rally Secretary Steve Weston explained. Uh, competitors have got the option not only of doing the, the full event, the big one, as it's been called, but they can also join the event just for the Australian section, which is 12 days of uh, gravel rallying, which has uh, recently been renamed the John Giddins Memorial Rally. Um, we had a guy from Australia, John Giddins, very well-known character in Australia, been involved in all f uh, forms of motorsport for many years, but unfortunately um, he passed away recently, and um, seeing that we been involved with him and he had an entry in, uh, we've managed to, well, with the permission of his family, to call that part of the event the John Giddins Memorial Rally, which we're hoping a few more Australians will join us for. When we get to Ankara, Ankara then, we also have another option. It's for competitors, yet again, to just join us in Ankara to do the European part, which is going to be the Dunlop, um, the Dunlop Trophy event. And um, that event is mainly tarmac, so it should not be damaging on the car. As Mark had told you, him and Mike Summerfield recently done the recce. It was, uh, I believe, 990 stage miles from Ankara up to the port in Cayenne where they, they uh, joined the ferry. 
Um, they've done the road book as far as the Seven Bridge and they're doing this thing in the tail part uh, later on in the year because we're local to that part of the world. That's being done um, at a later date. But um, that's a great opportunity for people, especially people doing the British Championship and the RAC Championship. They can do that with that sort of car. And now we're getting close to the end of our 2004 London to Sydney Marathon. The next day started without Jimmy McCray. And so, did Joe McCandrew ease up? Not a bit of it. He was nearly two minutes faster than anyone else on the first stage of the day. The event's longest so far at nearly 35 miles. Two minutes! It was almost as if he'd got proper paints notes, or had even seen it before, or had got a turbocharger or something. Astonishing, unbelievable really. Once again, these were stages that really suited the long-legged power of the historic cars, all of which had more power than any of the modern cars, but with no disrespect intended, weren't being driven by drivers with quite the same experience as the front runners. So at the end of a long tough day, there was obviously only one question. Where was Jimmy McRae and what had happened to his car? It's uh, an end of a tow rope <laughs> for the next 700 kilometres. Oh, Being towed all the way to Roma. 760. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll actually the... be quicker than the road section because KC's <laughs> <he's> towing us. <laughs> <laughs> and who's <is> he? <laughs> and what... you ever get, it, who's there. going to be sitting in the car? <laughs> Unfortunately me. Oh God. <laughs> Are you going to scare him? I'm going to give it my best shot. <laughs> Rallying doesn't get much better than this. Wide open, fast sweeping roads, slippery without being dangerous, undamaged by world rally cars running ahead of you and not a cloud in the sky. I know that I have whinged and moaned throughout about how uncompetitive our car had been, but we never let that detract from the fact that here we were, competing on the London to Sydney Marathon one of the world's longest, toughest and most famous rallies. Yes, here we were in Australia. In many respects, I regard these long distance events as true rallying. There are no pace notes, no maps, no practice periods, no recce. You just drive the stages as you see them. And really, isn't that what rallying should be about? Indeed used to be about, not knowing what's over the next crest or around the next corner. None of this moaning that the rallying is unsafe without a gravel crew, or your notes weren't quite right. And then keep your car going as well, for day after day after day. And yourself of course, because the endurance is there for your mind and body, just as much as it is for your car. It's rallies like the London to Sydney Marathon, and the World Cup rallies, which to my mind are real rallies, because they test everything to the limit. Not the high speed sprints that you tend to get nowadays. Why else would crews come from all around the world to take part in this event? We were now resigned to running for the rest of the rally on standard rear shock absorbers, and I was a bit wary of them. After all, standard shock absorbers aren't built to be used like this. But then neither are standard cars, to be honest. This stuff's so slippery. It's quite fun, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is good fun. What a shame for us, then that just as the stage has become the best that we have seen on the rally so far, our car is at its worst, and we were having to take it easy over even the gentlest of bumps, just in case the back end bounced too high in the air. It's the last day of the London to Sydney Marathon, and the only thing people are talking about is the great dice for 11th place between Jimmy McRae and me. How ridiculous is that? Can the five times British rally champion, seven times Circuit of Ireland winner, two-time Irish rally champion beat the television presenter, the bloke off the telly. We're one minute and 38 seconds ahead of him. Can he do it? I think so, don't you? One battle that did appear to be settled though 
was a contest for top historic car. How are you feeling this morning? Very good, very good. Yeah. Two, two stages to go. First classic in the bag, we hope. We hope, yep. Yeah. What's, your, what's your, your gap to the next one? About 12 minutes. So that's like, you can have two maximums, really. We could, it? yeah, 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 but we don't want road penalties, no, so no, no. just cruise through now, yeah. get to the end. Can you keep him under control or does he get a bit mad? No, he's right. It's a bit early for him, so it's not too bad now. In the afternoon, he starts to go wild. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. For the final time, we all made our way onto the stages. This was the 30th day. There had been almost 50 stages, and yet no one seemed to be easing up. Especially Jimmy McRae, who was so keen to overtake us. And Ian Begg, who had his best stage of the rally, with second here. Well, maybe Joe McAndrew eased up a bit. He was only third quickest on this stage for his worst result since, since somewhere in India. But he certainly wasn't about to throw it all away now. Shane Merlin couldn't believe his luck that he was now third. And although he appeared to be taking it easy, he had had engine problems for quite some time and was fortunate that he was still going so well. And Mike Montgomery was determined that nothing would happen to him at this late stage nor to Anthony Ward, who'd driven almost faultlessly on the whole event to take the biggest win of his rally career. We had things on our mind though. We were trying to hold off Jimmy McRae, which are words I thought I'd never say. And we thought that these last few stages were fantastic. You just have to wonder why all the stages can't be like this, don't you? Uh... We try so hard, and yet we look so slow. But never mind, we've been extremely lucky with our car, and we're going to get to Sydney, whatever our position. Jimmy McRae was fastest on the stage, but big shock to us, he didn't go past us in the standings. So here we are, about to start the last stage of the 2004 London to Sydney Marathon. Here we go. 400, right left chicane over bridge. So, do you think that we could hold off Jimmy McRae? Of course we couldn't, but it wasn't for lack of trying, and when you think of all the problems that had beset some of the larger teams, I think that we'd done pretty well to be honest. And these were the final results. First, second and third were the New Zealand Hondas, brilliantly prepared and superbly organised by John McAndrew. Not a professional rally driver at all, but a plumber. Fourth was the first of the Toyotas, Graham Lorimer and Nick Starkey. An excellent fifth, taking it just at the end, went to Ian Begg and Alan Diffie in another Toyota. And sixth were Anthony Ward and Mark Soloway in the Escort. And as we ourselves crossed the finishing line in front of the Sydney Opera House, we were 12th, we were happy, we were exhausted, we were glad it was over, and we had a head full of memories. Not in any way nervous as we set off on this great adventure. Make sure you just get your time, don't worry about anything, let's get your time. There's one pair of black marks going over the edge early on, but I didn't know who it was. I thought doing these international rallies was supposed to be glamorous. He just told them if he didn't go back, he'd shoot them. And we're trying to avoid dogs, cows, goats and other traffic. We toppled on the edge for what seemed like 10 years, and then boom, boom, boom. And there we are, 100 feet down in the bush. If anybody offered, ever offers you the chance to do a rally in India, don't think twice about it. Don't do it.
danger. 90% of Bob's life is a crisis, the rest is a drama. <laughs> Hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. It had been long, tough. It hadn't always been enjoyable, but it most certainly had been a marathon, and we had done it. We had completed the London to Sydney Marathon, and it doesn't get much better than that. That was bloody unbelievable. And so we had our fun in 2004. So now let's have a last word from the 2014 event secretary, Steve Weston. There seems to be lots of people coming forward neither to the to the event starting so so hopefully it's going to be a great success and you know we'll get the competitors to to support us um and you know really looking forward to it and can't wait for it to come basically mm -hmm.